There are few flowers quite as recognisable as the lily, yet despite its beauty, the lily or lilium is a toxic plant. All parts of the plant are poisonous, which is why it's recommended not to grow them if you have pet cats. So it's probably helpful then that the orange variety represents hatred and revenge, as well as desire and passion. Different types of the plant also offer mixed messages. For example, the Chinese lily or lilium speciosum means both you cannot deceive me and in love forever. Yellow lilies represented both falsehood and gaiety. So in some ways, this goes to show the somewhat contradictory nature of the flower used in both bridal bouquets and funeral wreaths. Yet in other ways, its contradictory uses make sense since they come from a common root, the link between the lily and purity. So let's go and explore the folklore behind the lily as well as its uses in magic in this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore. Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host Icy Sedgwick, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host Icy Sedgwick. We are coming to the end of our flowers theme for March, so I hope that you have enjoyed our whistle-stop tour through the Victorian language of flowers, the development of the apothecary garden into the poison garden, and lavender last week, and we're going to do lilies this week. So I hope that you enjoy what we're about to have a look at. Next week, I think we are going to start on a new theme, although I haven't quite decided what it is yet, so please keep an eye on my social media feeds and I'll no doubt say what it's going to be then. But we are going on to lilies this week and lilies are an interesting plant because they've got quite a really long history but they're also quite consistent as well which is really interesting and according to Samantha Gray lilies were first discovered growing in a villa garden in Amnisos Crete in around about 1580 BC and at one point the lily was sacred to the Minoan goddess Dictina also known as Brita Martis and she was a goddess of hunting and mountains, although her link with the latter could be due to the belief that she was an oread or mountain nymph. Now, Dictina was mostly worshipped on Crete, and she's sometimes syncretised with Artemis, the Olympian goddess of hunting. And lilies are also commonly found on Minoan ceramics as well, which does help to make this link between lilies and this particular goddess make a lot more sense. Now, it later became a plant associated with the Hellenic goddess Hera, wife of Zeus, and according to the legend, Zeus fathered Heracles with Alchemy, a mortal woman, and he wanted Heracles to be nursed by a goddess, not a human. So you do sort of think he maybe should have possibly thought about this before fathering a child with a mortal woman, but there we go. And he decided that Hera fit the bill. He didn't bother to ask her what she thought, as usual, so Zeus drugged poor Hera and placed Heracles at her breast while she was asleep. Now, Hera woke up and being both confused and horrified at Zeus's behaviour, she flung Heracles away from her and some of the milk drops created the Milky Way and some fell to earth and lilies then sprang up from these earthbound drops. So I always feel a little bit sorry for Hera in a lot of Greek mythology, particularly where Zeus is concerned, but this gives us an origin both for the Milky Way and lilies. Now, this isn't the only time that lilies are related to somebody's bodily fluids, and I know that sounds awful, but in Christianity, lilies actually came from Eve's tears after she was expelled from the Garden of Eden and discovering she was pregnant. And some people believe that lilies grew anywhere that her tears fell. And then beyond that, lilies also enjoy links with the Virgin Mary. So according to legend, the flowers were actually yellow until Mary picked some and then they turned white. And I think that it's this link between lilies and Mary that's a lot more prevalent than the link with Hera or indeed Dictina or or indeed Eve for that matter. So lilies came to represent the Annunciation and in art, saints often hand Mary or Jesus lilies and Gabriel in particular is often depicted carrying lilies particularly for the Annunciation. One famous example of this is Dante Gabriel Rossetti's painting The Annunciation, painted between 1849 and 1850, in which the angel Gabriel hands a somewhat cowering Mary a lily to mark the news that she would be the mother of Christ. Elsewhere, St Catherine converted her father to Christianity after the previously scentless Madonna lily suddenly produced its famous scent. And these links with Christianity do help to explain the associations of other species with similar qualities. So the Oriental lily or Lilium auratum meant pure of heart, while the meadow or field lily, which is Lilium canadense, represented humility. 
Now, Miss Carruthers, in her 1879 book of flower law, links the white lily specifically with the Annunciation on the 25th of March. And she also notes that at one point, Gabriel actually held a scepter or an olive branch, but in later Italian art, he then starts carrying lilies. And of course, this was what Rossetti was then referring to. The flower also became appropriate to the visitation of Our Lady on the 2nd of July when Mary visited her cousin Elizabeth and Miss Carruthers cites this as happening on 2nd of July as it did until 1969, though it's now 31st of May in Western Christianity. And interestingly, St Joseph is likewise associated with the lily as Mary's spouse and you can sometimes spot St Joseph in religious art since he often holds the lily as well and indeed there is an example of this on my blog of a statue that I found in Ushaw College in Durham where St Joseph is indeed holding a lily. Now lilies became the symbol of innocence, chastity and purity through this association with Mary but that said their earlier association with Dictina and artists could also help to explain the link both of which were virgin goddesses as well and the Madonna lily or Lilium Candidum specifically represented purity through the link with Mary. The Easter lily or Lilium Longiforum also represented purity, but this one also helped with employment, gambling, luck, power and protection, which is quite an interesting combination. And indeed, white lilies were usually used to represent virginity within the bridal bouquet, but they also meant celebration, sweetness, majesty and sent the message, it's heavenly to be with you. So there's quite a nice little link between all of those lovely qualities with white lilies, as well as them being about purity and so on. You've got things like celebration as well. But I should point out that Lily's also provided an incredibly intrusive method for worried parents to check if their daughter was still a virgin. Completely ignoring issues of consent or privacy, they might actually feed her powdered yellow lily and if she suddenly felt an urge to pee then she was still a virgin and there are so many things wrong with that. Now, lilies also appeared in the Maiden Garland to represent the deceased's virginity, and we have covered these before, but I will go through them again in case you didn't hear the hazel tree episode. Now, the Maiden Garland was a crown, usually made from either hazel or willow wood, and it was used to mark the death of a local person who had died unmarried. Now, these were usually women, but not always, and the mourners carried the garland above the coffin and then hung it in the church after the funeral above her particular pew, and it was left there until it rotted away. Now, some garlands were thrown out during renovations, but some have actually survived, so there are some photos of them. But in one description, we hear that they were made out of coloured paper made to look like flowers and then fixed on a circular hoop. And this is the part that's sometimes made from hazel. Now, a woman's glove was then cut out of white paper and hung from the middle, and they often wrote the woman's name and age on it. Now, earlier descriptions do talk about real flowers and gloves, but the paper ones did seem to become more common. But where fresh flowers were used, lilies were a popular choice through their links with purity. And indeed, lily wreaths used to be laid on the coffins of virgins as well. Now, obviously, as local church life changed and mourning itself altered, the tradition had almost completely died out by the 1920s. But it is quite interesting that Shakespeare actually mentions one in Hamlet about the funeral of Ophelia, in which she is allowed her virgin crans, which is another term for such a garland. And crans is believed to come from crans, the old Norse word meaning wreath. Now, it's perhaps the link between lilies and purity that explains why white lilies are so commonly used as funeral flowers, because the soul of the deceased is now at peace, which is represented by the lilies link with innocence. But the Flowers by Catherine website also pointed out that you can use stargazer lilies nowadays if you just simply want to symbolise sympathy and send them as sympathy flowers. Now, lilies became popular flowers to have engraved on grave monuments for children, unmarried women and young wives. And again, it was all through this link kind of with innocence and purity and things like that. So where you would then have potentially lilies in the bridal bouquet to represent virginity and purity, you were then starting to get them as a funeral end of the spectrum as well. And again, people would place lily wreaths on coffins, again, to draw on this representation of innocence. And their somewhat pungent perfume has become a bit of an olfactory link between floral arrangements and funerals. Now, we can't really talk about the lily and not discuss the fleur-de-lis. And this one was a bit of a research rabbit hole that I fell down because fleur-de-lis does translate as lily flower. So it would seem to be quite obvious that the symbol would be a lily, wouldn't it? Well, not necessarily, because some people actually think it's a stylized iris, not a lily. And according to Francois R. Veld, the fleur de lis actually dates back as far as Mesopotamia, and it became linked with royalty during the High Middle Ages. And it was first adopted as a heraldic motif in the 12th century by Philippe II. Now, the fleur de lis had already been used as an emblem on seals and coins since the 10th century. 
Now, it would be understandable for the plant to be adopted as a symbol if it was a lily to show that the French king was being blessed by God. And that is one of the explanations that was given in the 14th century, although that was already being disputed by the 17th century. Now, Velde points out that the early fleur-de-lis was always yellow, and obviously wild lilies aren't yellow. However, the wild iris, the iris pseudocorus, is. And this particular plant was called the Lischblume in German, which is sometimes spelled as Lies in the Middle Ages. So Veld suggests that the fleur de lis could actually refer to this yellow iris as a result and not a lily. Now, there is a lovely legend in which Clovis, the first king of the Franks, was heading to fight the king of Aquitania. But he and his men were stuck trying to cross a river and they couldn't find anywhere that they could actually get across the water. And eventually they just stumbled across a door who then fled in fright, but she crossed the river knowing a ford that she knew and reached safety. The men noticed the ford that she'd used and then obviously crossed as well. And wild yellow irises grew on the opposite bank, so Clovis apparently put one in his helmet to represent victory. Now, there is no evidence to suggest that any of this actually happened, but it is an interesting way to explain the choice of the fleur de lis and its identity as an iris, not a lily. That being said, the Encyclopedia Britannica does relate the legend in which Clovis was given a lily at his baptism, and at this point the church used the lily to link significant events with Mary's sanctity, so it's also entirely possible that it is a lily. And I should point out that it does actually represent the lily in other places, such as Bosnia and Florence, so it's a little bit of a mixed bag really as to whether it's a lily or an iris. Now we are going to go on to the more folklore end of the spectrum beyond all these legends and everything. And in terms of its medicinal uses, obviously, as I explained at the beginning, the lily is a toxic plant. So I am relating these historical uses of lilies in the interest of entertainment, not education. So obviously, please don't try any of these at home. But lilies were found throughout the Roman Empire. And Margaret Baker suggests that the Romans planted lilies near camps because it was believed that they could cure corns, which would obviously have been a very common complaint among foot sore soldiers. Now, meanwhile, boiled white lily roots, onion roots and chamomile flowers were also used to make a hot poultice which would draw boils. Now, those ones I can sort of understand a little bit because it's very much external uses. So perhaps they already were aware of its toxicity. And the other one that I really highly recommend that you don't do is bathing the face in lily flower water was supposed to remove wrinkles. And I would say you could just embrace your wrinkles as a sign that you've lived. But there we go. Now, obviously, lilies are fine to admire and they were used alongside St. John's wort, roses and birch in midsummer decorations. And let's be honest, lilies are beautiful plants and they do smell really nice. So I can understand why you would then use them to celebrate something like midsummer. And there was a superstition that claimed that if lilies were plentiful in bloom, the wheat crop would be good that year. And meanwhile, Turk's cap lily would assure victory to any soldiers who looked at it. And alchemists thought that it could actually help turn base metals into gold simply because the inside of the bulb was found to be golden yellow in colour. And it's no surprise then that the Turk's cap lily does actually represent both pride and wealth, although its associations with both chivalry and misanthropy are a little harder to fathom. Now, in terms of magic, in general terms, lilies could help with breaking love spells, banishing ghosts, repelling unwanted visitors and providing protection. And I feel like a lot of these, again, fall under the auspices of what you would get through the links with Mary. Now, the tiger lily, or Lilium columbianum, was a good choice because it could help boost both wealth and prosperity, as well as offering protection. Although, let's be honest, you'd probably need protection following a sudden influx of wealth anyway. And if you wanted to keep away ghosts and evil, you simply had to plant lilies in your garden. White Madonna lilies are often cited as the best way to keep ghosts from the home. Although, according to Margaret Baker, they could only grow for a good woman, although she doesn't give a definition of what a good woman actually is. And carrying a lily could stop snakes from approaching you, which seems a little bit random. Now, wearing lilies would help break any love spells being cast upon you. And William Lilly actually placed both white and yellow lilies into the domain of Venus in astrological magic, which would sort of make this love link make sense. But even more strange, and this is by far my favourite, you could use lilies for crime detection. So if you had a lily bed in your garden, you could simply bury a piece of leather in it and doing so would prompt clues about crimes committed in the preceding year to come to light. And you don't see that on CSI. So from all of this, we can see that while the lily has had a myriad of uses, many of them can be traced back to its link with the Virgin Mary. And using the lily as imagery helps to either tell people that you're pure and innocent or endorsed by the Queen of Heaven. So it's no wonder that they were a popular plant for protection and victory. 
And that's why the debate over the fleur de lis is such an interesting one, because the case for the emblem being an iris is a strong one. But in many ways, the link with the lily would actually make more sense. But either way, just remember that they are bad for cats. So if you do choose to plant them, do be careful where you put them. And also, why not keep a piece of leather handy if you fancy doing some floral crime detection near your lily beds? So what I want to know is what do you think of lilies? Do you like them? Do you dislike them? Do you find the scent a little bit overpowering? Let me know. Obviously, you can post a comment if you're watching this on YouTube or you can tweet me or post on Instagram, whatever you fancy. Or again, if you want to pop over to the blog post that this is related to, you can do that as well. I do also want to point out that it's been a bumper month for Patreon supporters. So obviously, as always, the, there's different levels that people get different things. There's been an exclusive article on the Ides of March and what it actually means. We had a storytelling rendition of the legend of Sagai the Seeker from Dunsinbrook Castle up in Northumberland. If you're listening to this on Saturday the 26th, there is also a talk on the representation of the medium in British horror cinema, which you can watch live because that's going to be a live talk on Zoom with a QA and a at the end. And then the exclusive episode this month is actually going to be on the folklore of snakes, obviously because there's been a lot of stuff online around St. Patrick's Day and whether he drove snakes out of Ireland and what that meant. So I thought we'll have a look at the folklore and legends of snakes this month. So you can get access to that at different levels on Patreon. So if any of that sounded interesting please do feel free to check out the link below in the show notes. And that's the Fabulous Folklore Family link. Obviously, if you can't afford a recurring subscription to support the podcast, then obviously you can either take the free option and leave a review because that does actually help with things like algorithms and making sure that it gets recommended to people. So it is really, really helpful to leave a review. You can tell a friend. You can share any of the posts on social media. Anything like that is really, really helpful and really useful as a means of support. So that's absolutely cool. If you do want to chip in to help with the running costs of the podcast, then you can always buy me a coffee as well. And the link for that is below. But anyway, I hope that you've enjoyed this week's episode and that you've learned a little bit more about the lily. As I say, I haven't quite decided what next month's theme is going to be because I've got a couple to choose from. Well, actually, I've got, sev- I've got several to choose from. I'm not quite sure which one I'm going to do first. But obviously, pop back next week and see which one it is that I've actually gone for. So without any further ado, I hope that you enjoy your week ahead. And I'll see you next week. Cheerio. Well, thank you for listening. And thanks for visiting Fabulous Folklore. I hope you enjoyed your stay. If you did, why not consider subscribing in your podcast app of choice? If you enjoy the show, why not leave me a review and help other listeners to find it as well? And if you'd like bonus exclusive episodes of the podcast, then why not support me on Patreon? It does help me to keep the show going and it means that you get a little bit extra every month as well. And you can find all of the necessary links in the show notes below. So without any further ado, I will bid you adieu and I hope that you have a safe travels wherever you're going on to next. Do adieu and I hope that you have a safe travels wherever you're going on to next.